Morning, church. How we doing? It is great to be here with you all this morning. Uh, my name is Chris Lamoa, and I help lead the team ministry here in Riverside. And I just want to say greetings from Team Camp 2019. And if you couldn't tell from my voice, I came back physically <laughs> exhausted from camp. I woke up Saturday morning uh, feeling weak. I have a sore throat. I have a nasty cough and a horrible headache. Uh, but spiritually, I am fired up for these teens. Uh, the kids and I, we got back Friday afternoon this, from this year's camp, and it was called Kingdom. And we had tribe competitions, sports, we had worship, uh, breakout sessions. Uh, we had awesome sermons talking about how great and amazing the kingdom of God is. And today we're actually going to hear uh, a little bit from these teens right here about what they learned from teen camp. Uh, so give it up for Alondra and Ricky Garcia. Good morning, y'all. <laughs> um. Um, hi, my name is Alondra, and this was my first year of teen camp. And um, to be honest with you guys, I was really nervous um, to go to teen camp. And um, I still remember telling uh, my cabin um, in the beginning that um, <laughs> I didn't know if I was going to like you guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> but in the end, um, uh, we made lots of beautiful memories together, and they turned out to be one of um, the greatest and funniest people like I've ever known. And um, going there, I felt like I knew it was going to be expected, and even what was just going to be expected of me. And um, uh, the scariest part was just um, I knew where I was at, and um, that I knew, like in some way, like somehow, like a lesson or a song would just come and it would just like hit me and like speak directly to me. 
And um, that was just scary because um, I didn't want to know um, right from wrong. And um, I guess I just accepted where I was at. And I was just comfortable that way. And, um, you know, sometimes, like, I still am. And as you can imagine, like, that fear um, came to pass. And, um, and you know how hard it was to... Um, to look at my friends and my counselor in the eyes and just tell them um, the truth about was just what was really on my heart and um, just the courage that they had to um, to do the same and just to trust me and um, other girls that they didn't even know all that well um, was just a great example of vulnerability and real love and um, that just inspired me to have a heart that um, I didn't originally plan on having coming into teen camp. And um, a lesson that really stood out to me um, that I really love was called Confidence. And the speaker really just painted a picture of the story of um, Jesus and Peter when they walked on water. And as he was speaking, I feel like um, it just became really evident that our struggles and inward battles uh, don't end like when we come out of the water. And um, as he was speaking, I feel like um, it just became, um, uh, like most of you in this room, um, you know, Peter um, took that leap of faith and even though he was only on water for like 30 seconds, um, the important thing to keep in mind was just that he put comfortability aside and just decided to step out of the boat. And that was really just the message of that lesson, just the question of, are we willing to step out of the boat? And um, I've just decided um, that to not let this week go, um, go unnoticed and just to take a step forward in the kingdom. And um, you know, all in all, camp was, um, was amazing. The worship was impeccable, like the lessons were life-changing. And the la laughter and energy of every room that I stepped into was just, really contagious. And yeah, that was Teen Camp. Thank you for letting me share. Ooh, he's Rick's son. He's going to be funny. I'm just kidding. No. Um, uh, <laughs> um, my name is Ricky Garcia. And my time, this is my third year of Teen Camp, actually. And this year was amazing because of all the friends that I made in various different regions. It really opened my eyes of others' testimony as I shared with them. And I also participated in the lip sync competition. It was awesome. Um, my favorite part of the camp was the lesson by Rick Meckhamson. It was titled, The Kingdom Be Like. Um, <laughs> it helped me understand what it meant to be a kingdom kid and that um, I didn't really have to be ashamed that I didn't really go through a lot of sin like others outside of the church. And I can look to myself as a child raised by God. And uh, Luke 13, 18 through 19 says, you don't have to turn there. When Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? Shall I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds preached in his, uh, perched in his, in his branches. And he really helped me understand that I just need to be me. I don't really need to look to other idols, such as celebrities and stuff. God just wants me to be me, and he wants me to be a mustard seed, so that way he can make me grow into a tree. And thank you, guys. Really, me share. Amen. So as you guys can tell, Teen Camp was awesome. And, you know, during the week, I cried a lot just seeing these kids, uh, you know, give their hearts and to, and to serve in this way. Um, but right now, we're going to have a five-minute video uh, just to give you guys a little glimpse of what Teen Camp was really like so we can play the video.
um, this is my last year, so I'm very sad to leave. The most impactful part was definitely the lessons, so. Um, so this is my freshman year and I loved it. Uh, drop zone is definitely great. I loved Rick's lesson. Uh, first night, it was just inspiring to get to know God and just to aspire to join the kingdom. Camp this year was um, incredibly awesome. I just love the worship and I love getting to know people more. And I think I'm just so incredibly grateful for God for putting me in this place where I have incredible people around me that's gonna help me grow to be with God even more every day. Camp this year was amazing. And one impactful thing about it was uh, the worship. Uh, camp was amazing. It was my last year. Um, yeah, and I just love how God just meets us where we're at, you know, and I don't have to be perfect. And I just love that about God. He's just so awesome, so amazing. And yeah. <laughs> camp this year was really different this year for me, especially because I'm a disciple now. And all conflict was either non-existent or when there was little ones, we would get over it so easily. Camp this year was really impactful for me and I really enjoyed hearing the prayer and meditation lesson because it just really taught me how to have an intimate relationship with God. Camp this year was for sure fulfilling and I definitely think it was like our tribe because it, they're just so loving and so encouraging and every time I'm with them I feel so hyped up and I love it. Camp this year was amazing. I love worship. I love meeting new people. It was so encouraging. One thing that impacted me the most is how much Jesus loves me and just Jesus loves everyone and it's just so impactful. I love it. <laughs> One great thing, um, camp was Camp was amazing. Amen. Let's pray as we continue worshiping God. Father God, thank you so much for this morning. Um, I'm so inspired by these teens uh, just to share their hearts and, and what impacted them, Father God. I think teen camp this year was so successful. Uh, just seeing them transform throughout the week and even seeing them now back at home still fired up, Father God. I really pray for each and every single one of them, especially in the Riverside Teen Ministry, God, uh, that you can continue to, to build them up, Father, as they continue to seek you out. I'm just so grateful to be a part of their lives. And um, right now, I pray for the rest of this service. And you still need my pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we continue worshiping God.
Morning, church. I think I'm little Rick now. I don't know. It's all right. You never know what our kids are going to say. But I just, uh, while I'm up here, I just wanted to say thanks to Chris and Lois and all the teen workers uh, for doing the teen camp. We we are a blessed group when someone will. De- dedicate a week of their lives to help our children. Um, you know, uh, they asked me to do communion today, and uh, it was really a little difficult because I was on vacation, and I had to come back here. 
and our vacation was amazing. Not that I don't love you, but uh, you know, it's hard to get back into the swing of things when you wake up in the morning and you're seeing the beach right there. For those of you know who we went, but uh, you know, I was reading a lot over the time we were out and just really meditating. Got a lot of time to just do a whole lot of nothing, just eat and sleep and play games. That's that was our vacation, and it was amazing. And I came across an article about Larry David, and, and he's a comic writer. You know, he writes all these uh, you know, sitcoms or whatever. He created Seinfeld and Curb Your Enthusiasm. He gets invited to go to a Yankees game, and they show his picture on the big screen, and the whole crowd goes nuts, and they're all cheering him, and he's all fired up. And then uh, as he's leaving, he walks out in the parking lot, and somebody just insults him and says, you know, Larry, you stink, you know, and... Um, about a month later, he's being interviewed by People Magazine. They're talking about that, and the first thing out of his mouth was how he was hurt by this person after the game. You know, and that stuck with him. And I think, man, that is kind of um, us, you know? We may see something in the news, we may be at work, or we may be around people, and words and things that we see and uh, can hurt us. And, uh, but it's pretty amazing to think that your picture is on a big screen, the entire stadium cheers, you'd think that would be a defining moment in his life, but the one thing he remembers was the one fan after that, uh, you know, says one bad thing about him. You know, it, it's funny, it, it, it all, it, we could have a hundred compliments to us and it takes one negative thing and just, we just negate all the others. And uh, it, it's amazing because the media is just so ripe with you, you. I get on the news and I start reading the news. I'm chilling, relaxing on the beach, and I pick up my phone and go to the news, and it's just horrible. I mean, it's just absolutely like, why am I doing this? Like, and you know, it's it's all this. Is it fake news? Is it real news? Did this really happen? That it didn't happen? Are they spinning it a weird way? And then you look at all those causes through there, you know, all the social media and all the social issues, the Me Too movement, the uh, Time Is Up, the uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, Muslim ban, the DACA, the um, No Ban, No Wall, Make America Great, and tons more. They're just all these issues that are real hot spots. And in and of itself, those things are great. But, uh, you know, I think about this time, I think about communion. And, um, you know, all the time that's put in all those issues, and yet each week we're, we, we're told to remember what Jesus did on the cross for us. You know, and you ask yourselves, you know, what, is, what does communion have to do with all that? What does Jesus' death have to do with that? You know, there's all these theological and doctrinal reasons uh, we're encouraged to regularly observe the communion as believers. But maybe we have some practical reasons, too. You know, maybe, you know, in life, we're, we're regularly criticized, we're insulted, um, and hurt by the words of others. Maybe these social issues are at the forefront of our mind, and we just can't get them, all these images and all these things out, and rightly so, they're unjust. You know, perhaps, maybe we just need a regular reminder each week, and the words and the actions of what Christ did, that are what our true important purpose is. You know, maybe we just need reminders, a re weekly reminder of how much Jesus loves us. Think about that, Jesus loves you. You're valued. You mean something to God. You're not just a nobody. You know, Jesus says in uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. You know, we're fragile. We, we, you think about how things affect us in the news, how many of these issues affect us, and yet we have the answer to all those problems. Our congregation, the Bible, Jesus gives us a blueprint of happiness for our life. You know, as we take communion today, let's really think about how much we're deeply loved by God and how much we're needed in the world to really spread the gospel. Yes. We're deeply valued, and most of all, we're forgiven. 
Let's pray as we take communion. Father God, thank you so much for your love and your mercy in our lives. Thank you for just the leadership that we have in our church, God, the, um, the family that we have here, that we help each other, we take care of our children, they uh, go out on these great camps and pour their lives into our, in, into our kids to really help them see there's more to this world than the news. That you died on the cross, God, means everything to us. It's the reason we are here today. It's the reason that we have eternal life. I love that Kingdom Kids verse is hide it under a bush, no. It's so simple. It's the simplest thing. Should we be out there sharing our faith? Absolutely. And God, I'm sorry for not doing a better job at sharing my faith. I know I have the, the answer. Help me to be more out of myself, more giving, more loving, more serving. Help me to be a better disciple. Thank you for um, this time, and thank you for uh, your, your word, God. I love you. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Rosa did a good job. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, for, for a while, I've kind of come to, to love the Garcia family a lot and appreciate them, so I wish that I can come up here and say that I'm medium Ricky. Um, but no, I'm not. But uh, I, I'm Roy, uh, and I have the privilege to be able to share uh, and, and guide our hearts uh, into connecting with the uh, contribution, with the offering. And I want you guys, if you guys have your Bible, uh, to turn it to 1 Chronicles 29 and just put your finger on it, and that's going to be our focal um, scripture today. But I found this uh, story uh, reading 
First Chronicles, and you might as well ask, what, what are you doing in First Chronicles? But there's a lot of great stuff in First Chronicles. Uh, and I found this story this morning to be special because uh, in this story, this gives us a glimpse uh, of kind of the end of David's life uh, and some of the lasting impressions that he made uh, to the Israelite kingdom that, that he helped build. Right? And the Israelite kingdom at this, uh, at this time was at his heyday, uh, and it was amazing. But David's life ended at the age of 70. Right? And the world today uh, can make some weird stereotypes about old age. Right? Uh, some are funny, some are a little bleak, but uh, old age, right? Uh, and I feel like the idea of old age is not necessarily something that you know, we ask for our birthday. Uh, but David in his old age was a man of great example. Uh, and I love the example that he set. And a lot of the times that when I would be up here sharing about the offering, I tend to make a lot of connections with uh, what helps my heart in giving uh, with my interactions with my Filipino mom. Uh, and I make jokes about that all the time. Uh, but I love my mom. Uh, and the reason why it's fun sharing about her sometimes is because um, she's the epitome of a Filipino mom, right? And they're funny, and their antics can be very funny, right? But lately, uh, I've been thinking about my grandma. Uh, and if Filipino moms are one thing, uh, Filipino grandmas are on a whole other level. Uh, you know, my grandma is like any other Filipino grandma that you would see walking the street, right? Her savagery level uh, is at a, like a nine out of 10. Uh, she has no clue what a filter is. And so if you're, uh, she'll, she'll tell you right off the bat if you're too fat or you're too skinny, right? But regardless of what you look like, you, you still are not eating. Like you still need to eat. Uh, you know, she used to make uh, fake NBA jerseys. Uh, and this was kind of her living. Uh, and it was like the only business in, in the province, in the Filipino town, which were the really poor areas. And so she was like the Don Corleone of like the, of the Philippines. <laughs> Uh, and uh, for, one, for Christmas, she gave me uh, a, what I thought was a Kobe Bryant jersey, um, but it just said Brian on the back. Uh, and so I would tell my friends, you know, my favorite player is the shooting guard starting at number eight at the Lakers, Brian with an N, not with a T at the end. Um, you know, and I, obviously I was not that good of a kid. I was not, I was not obedient. And so Filipino culture, we, we, we spank our kids. Ooh, we spank our kids. Uh, and so they're called palos, P-A-L-O. They're called palos. And you know, Mexican culture, you have the chancla, right? You, you, your grandma throws the shoe when you're acting up. But my, mom, uh, my grandma did not uh, throw a shoe. She had the palo hand. So if I was acting up on uh, the other end of the, the room, uh, then she would just do this. And I knew that I, I had to stop, right? <laughs> you know? You know, these memories of my grandma are still so clear in my head. Uh, and even though she passed away a few years ago, um, the one thing that I always remember is not um, the counterfeit jerseys or the Palo hand, but she was a faithful disciple. And I love that that was her lasting impression in this life is that she lived her life for God. And so, like I said, we're going to read in First Chronicles 29 and look at David's example here. Uh, and... In the scripture, it says, Then King David said to the whole assembly, My son Solomon, the one whom God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. The task is great because the palatial structure is not for a man, but for the Lord God. With all my resources, I have provided for the temple of my God gold for the gold work, silver for the silver, bronze for the bronze, iron for the iron, and wood for the wood, as well as onyx for the settings, uh, turquoise, stones of various collect." colors and all kinds of fine stone and marble and all in these large quantities. Besides, in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God over and above everything I have provided and above everything I have provided for this holy temple. And what we're reading here is David is talking about a temple that he wants to build. And God has casted a vision upon him that, that he was going to build this magnificent temple that was going to worship God. Uh, and, and going down to verse 6, it says, Then the leaders of the families, the officers of the tribe of Israel, the commanders of the thousands and commanders of the hundreds, and the officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. They gave the thousands of talents, 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 100,000 ta ta talents of iron, uh, and anyone who had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the temple of the Lord in the custody of um, Jehol the Gershonite. 
The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. Um, David the king also rejoiced greatly. You know, before David passed away, uh, because of his love, we kind of see that um, with, with what God has done in his life, his family, the victories of his kingship, right, that he wanted to build um, a house that was a place of rest uh, and, the, and, uh, and where the promises of God can remain. And I love this heart in David because through all the ups and downs in his life, as we read in the past scriptures, he realized that he was devoted to God and that he was grateful. And what manifested was that was something great that he wanted to give to God, even at the end of his life. And if you read um, past Second Chronicles, this temple was the most uh, amazing and most magnificent sight that you can ever see. Right? In Second Chronicles, it was titled the most holy place. Right? And, and how many, many of you guys believe that this building wouldn't have happened if, if we didn't see the response of the people here in the scripture? That out of their willing hearts, that they were not focused on the demands of giving or if David forced them to give, but they willingly responded and the people rejoiced because of it. And I think that's the focal point of the scripture that impacted me was in verse 9 that the people rejoiced uh, in the willing response of the people, right? And this goes to show that their action was not because it was forced, but it was a part of their, and not a part of their culture, but it was because the people saw a need and they responded with an action. Uh, and I think, you know, David um, didn't really see his temple come to fruition. He didn't see the temple being built after he died. But I would like to imagine and I would like to believe that what David was envisioning was not a building that was made out of gold or a building that was 30 feet high or all these different things. But I think what David might have envisioned was this right here, was the place that you're sitting right now or the people that you're surrounded by and the, and the reason why you're here worshiping God this morning, that he envisioned a place where God can reside, but the people, the people that he loved can commune with God. And this is the church here today. And I think that's what David wanted to build was the church here today. But I think what convicts me is, you know, God has given me so much. And if I'm called to meet a need in the church, will I be willingly responsive to meet the need in the church? And I think I can fall short in that. Um, but I pray that as the trace pass and that we can connect with the, with the contribution, that we can connect with David's heart. Uh, and this is the last scripture that we're going to read in verse 17, um, where David prays, I know my God that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. And David is talking about us. But I pray that as we... Um, give our offering and whatever is on our hearts that we can have that joy, that willingness to respond in the way that because God has given us so much, uh, we're just here to offer our lives as a sacrifice and our wealth and our money is a result of that. And so with that, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer uh, as, a, as a contribution comes. Uh, well, Heavenly Father, God, I want to thank you, Lord, so much for uh, this amazing uh, service, God, this morning, Lord, that we can uh, be in communion with you. God, it's such a privilege that even in uh, celebrating even July 4th, God, and our independence, Lord, like, we wouldn't be able to be here right now, God, and, and we are so blessed uh, to be in a country where we can uh, worship freely, pray freely, give freely, um, live our lives for you, devoted to you, Lord, without any persecution, uh, but God, I pray that uh, we see the blessings that are in our lives today, God, the church that you have given us, the family that you have given us, God, and and that we don't look at uh, the way that we give as a response or, or, or a forceful response, but a willing response where our hearts can connect uh, to worship and glorify you and give you the glory that you deserve, God. And I pray that you can be with the remaining of our day. In all your son's name, amen.
All right, as the trees finish passing by, why don't we all stand up uh, to sing, I could sing of your love forever.
you my sin was heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory i needed shelter i wasn't orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven seated. We're going to do a little stage switch up real quick. Thank you, bro. How you guys doing this morning? Well, uh, it is great to be with you guys. Uh, I know it's been shared a lot already uh, for our time here, but uh, Sylvia and I just came back from teen camp, and... Um, we have the opportunity to serve on staff at teen camp, and uh, we lead a group of incoming college freshmen that decide to use a week of their summer to serve at teen camp, and uh, they basically do all the miscellaneous grunt work that nobody else wants to do, and we lead that group. We're called the runners, because we run everywhere throughout camp, uh, but it was an awesome time. I'm coming back super tired, and feels like I've got something in my throat, but like Chris said, camp was incredible. And uh, if you've not been to teen camp, I want to encourage you, be a counselor. If you're in high school, be a camper. Uh, you do not want to miss. I think this is one of our church's best events that we put on every year. Um, and yeah, it's fun. You play sports. You play games. You know, guys don't take showers. You eat food and all that great stuff. But I'd say by far the most incredible thing is just seeing these high schoolers worship God. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what you guys went through in high school, but I know for me, high school was not a place of God. <laughs> and so to see a bunch of teenagers, high school students, want to work, you should have seen the worship concerts. They, they would run and flood the state, like the front of the stage, uh, as soon as they said it was time to start singing, because they wanted to be up front and worship God. And I saw kids crying. I was crying a little bit. I don't know if it's because I was tired or, or I was really feeling it or what, but it was an amazing, amazing time. And if you have not been to teen camp, um, I think you need to go ahead and figure out how you can get into camp next year because it's incredible. Uh, but God not only moved in the teen ministry this week, but also in the campus ministry. And we had a baptism. Noah Kim got baptized. <laughs> Noah's right there. Go ahead and stand up, Noah. Come on, wave to your family, bro. Yes. Noah is uh, an amazing man. He's a part of the UCR ministry. Uh, he just finished his freshman year, and uh, he is in God's kingdom now, and it's incredible. We're so happy to have him. Um, today we're going to be continuing our series entitled, What Makes You Happy? What Makes You Happy? You know, Sergio kicked off our series last week talking about how happiness is found in the kingdom of God. And... And that was the Sermon on the Mount, right? He introduced the Sermon on the Mount, and that's what it was all about. Jesus wanted to present uh, to this crowd of people what being in the kingdom of God is all about. And he starts off with something interesting. He starts with something called the Beatitudes, right? These can be viewed as things, as attitudes we need to be or attitudes we need to have in being the kingdom of God. The Beatitudes have also been identified as the very characteristics of a citizen of the kingdom of God. And so we talked about last week, we talked about this last week, but what happened here is right before this, in the chapter right before it, Jesus is doing these incredible miracles, right? He's healing. People are so wowed by, by all the things he's doing, so they start to follow him. They start to see, well, man, what is this dude all about? And so they follow him, and Jesus takes the opportunity, right? He, he, he allows the crowd to follow him. He goes up on a mountainside, 
And he actually, he takes a seat. The Bible says he took a seat. Now it was customary in this time when a teacher was teaching, he, the teacher would take a seat and the crowd would stand. Now I don't know about you, but I think this is how we need to start doing church. I think I should sit for 35 minutes and you guys should stand for 35 minutes and listen to the teachings. But we won't do that here. So it says Jesus began to, to teach them as he was seated. Now this is interesting because there's this big crowd at this point, but he's focused on his disciples, but he allows the rest of the crowd to hear him teach his disciples. And I think that's because Jesus' teachings weren't for, the, it wasn't exclusive, right? It wasn't for the cool kids club. It was for anybody. And so, yes, he was focused on his disciples, but I'm sure he was speaking pretty loud so that the rest of the, the group could hear him. So, so he starts probably one of the most famous sermons ever written. And he starts out by saying, blessed are the perfect. Oh, wait, that's not what he said. <laughs> Blessed are the ones who have it all together. Blessed are the ones who are just naturally spiritual. Blessed are the ones who just listen to what I have to say and fall in line. No, he, he doesn't say that. Right, he has this whole crowd's attention Right, Jesus can literally say whatever he wants. You know, I think if I were Jesus, I'd probably start bragging about myself. Yeah, I'm the son of God. Fall in line. Listen to what I have to say. Follow me because I'm amazing and this is what I can do. Probably shoot laser bolts out my finger because God in the flesh. But that's not how he decides to start this sermon Jesus has this opportunity. He has everybody's attention. And so what does he do? He finds a seat and he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I think it's interesting that Jesus doesn't start out his sermon with all these expectations of what it must mean to follow him or what people must be or what they must have or what they must do in order to be a follower or be blessed by God. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. What does that mean? What does that mean to be poor in spirit? You tell me to be broke? Is this a money scheme to give money to your church? Poor in spirit, what, what does that mean? I like what it says in the New Living Translation here. It said, God blesses those who realize their need for him. Or God's word version says, God blesses those who recognize they are spiritually helpless. The contemporary English version says, who depend only on him. Or the new century version, who know they have great spiritual needs. I want to identify, just, just for our time here, I want to really summarize and put into a sentence what I think and what I get out of the scriptures being poor in spirit really means. Being poor in spirit is when we see our need for God and is expressed by depending on his power and trusting his promises. I love that this, this is what Jesus started his sermon with. Right? He didn't, he didn't show off his power. He didn't prove who he was with this whole crowd and their attention. He didn't bark orders at them or give them a list of rules and expectations, but he said, blessed are those who just realize what they really need in this life. Because the reality is, is without this being the first beatitude, the rest of them, they would be impossible. They would be grueling. They would give you headaches if we don't first realize and see our need for God. You know, my hope and, and my prayer this morning is that we can all kind of take the first step in living how God wants us to live in the kingdom, and I believe that starts with being poor in spirit, by seeing your need for God. Let's go ahead and say a word of prayer, and we'll jump into a scripture for today. God, thank you so much for this time, and, and God, just how you've been moving uh, in our lives, in our church, in our community so incredible to be at teen camp, God, seeing you move, 
seeing, seeing teenagers not care what anybody else thinks, losing their voice, singing to you, being in the lip sync, making a fool of themselves for you, and having so much fun worshiping your name and, and praising you, God, that we get a chance to be a part of this. I want to pray for the high schoolers in particular that they don't lose that fire, that they're able to come to church and, and realize that they're worshiping and praising and learning about the same God they learned about at camp. God, I pray the rest of the church that we can take note of these high schoolers and see their fire and see their zeal and see the, the purity in their hearts to know and, and be closer to God. God, help us learn from your son and from your scriptures about what it means to be poor in spirit. We love you. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Today I want to read a famous parable that Jesus uh, talked about uh, where he talked about a son who needed to become poor in spirit in order to find what he was truly looking for. Turn over with me to Luke 15. Uh, and we're going to start there in verse 11. Talk about the prodigal son this morning. In Luke 15, verse 11, it says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property to them, and not long after that, the young son got together all he had and set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. You know, this morning I want to pull three practicals from this story about what it looks like to really become poor in spirit. You know, the first one I want to pull from here is we've got to be able to trust his wisdom and not our own wisdom. And that's a part of being poor in spirit. You know, I look at this story, and at some point in this young man's life, he woke up and thought about his life, thought about his dad, and thought, okay, God, I, or dad, I'm, I'm, I'm in your realm. I'm in, I'm in the boundaries of your land. You run things here. But you know what? I can do better. I can do better than you. So, so God, or, or dad, why don't you just give me what you're going to leave me when you die right now? And I'm going to go do better because I can do better. In other words, I want what you have to offer, but I don't really want you. And so he told his father, give me, give me all that I have and I'm going away. You know, Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end, the end of the way is death. You ever had an idea that seemed right at the time? Like it was just the thing to do and this is so clearly what I've got to do and I'm going to do it? I remember a couple years ago I was on a soccer team uh, that a lot of us here in the church uh, were, were a part of. We were preparing for the big soccer tournament our church holds every year. And we played in the city league and one guy had the idea of, hey, let's bleach our hair. Let's do it. And at the time, I was an intern for the church, and so I spoke a lot. I would do communion. I would do midweeks for the campus ministry. And I thought, let's do it. Let's, let's dye our hair. Let's bleach our hair. Why not? And so I did. I bleached my hair. Showed up to church the next day. Stuart, who is, you know, my mentor and works for the church and is employing me as an intern of the campus ministry, goes, you're not allowed on stage until you shave that thing off your head. But in the moment, it seemed like such a good idea. It seemed right. You know, I found this picture on the internet. I think this is like every, every parent, I, oh my goodness. But somewhere in that infant child's head, he thought, man, it's just right to lather myself in peanut butter. This is just what I need to do. This is, this is the right answer in my life right now. Boom. Thank God it's peanut butter and not something else, you know what I mean? Or this one. I don't know if you can read that. That's a tattoo that says, no regerts. I feel like that's pretty self-explanatory. He probably just thought that was right at the time. It seemed right. I, it felt right. 
I think this is right. Those must have been the famous last words of this, this young son before he found himself desiring to eat the same food pigs were eating in his life. You know, we might not deliberately tell God, I can do better, but the way we live, the way we make decisions, the wisdom we go off of can pretty much be summed up to sometimes as, well, it seems right to me. And like I said, basically what that is, is we're living according to our feelings or our wisdom or what we feel is right. And I look at this young son's story and I believe that's the very moment his life was initiated into failure is when he said, hey, I, I can do better than my dad. You know, we all have a way that seems right, but we live according to what seems right. In my experience and what I've witnessed when someone goes based off their own wisdom and just what feels right and what they've been taught is right growing up, it oftentimes leads to catastrophe. Right, their life, they, 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 they look at where they're at in life and, and things they swore they'd never do or places they'd never be, they're now looking at their life going, how, how did I get here. You know, I live, I love this proverb in chapter 3, verse 5. Write it down. I'm reading from the NLT version. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you with which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, respect the Lord and turn away from evil. Like I said, I don't think we as people can look, God, look at God or pray to God and go, I know better than you. But I think we can get into the pattern of life of, well, it just, it seems right. This is what I feel is right. I need to live this because this is what I want to do. This is right. Here's some things I want you to think about. Parents, I, I'm not a parent. I'm not, I'm not even going to pretend. I'm not going to compare my dog to, to having a baby that covers himself in peanut butter and other weird items in the house. So, but parents, how much do you rely in, and seek God's wisdom on how you parent? Or do you go off on what just seems right? Marrieds. How much do you follow God's guide and wisdom in how you set up your marriage dynamic? Or do you go on what just seems right? I don't know about the husbands in the room, but when I go on what just seems right, it always ends up wrong. Church, how much do we seek God's will and wisdom in our careers? in our schooling, in our daily decisions, in finding our future boo things. I looked at the campus ministry for that one, the teen ministry. How much do we rely on God's wisdom? Because I can tell you the blessing in being poor in spirit is that you desire the wisdom and will of God over your own. You know, the next practical I wanna take out of this is we've got, in being poor in spirit, we've got to depend on his strength and not our own. Men and women who are poor in spirit depend on God's strength. When I look at the son in this parable, uh, something in him decided, I don't need my dad's help anymore. I can do life on my own. But obviously that didn't go well for him because he got crushed trying to live and do things on his own. You ever feel crushed by life? You ever feel like just things are coming in too hot, too fast, too much, too many trials, too much stress, too much anxiety, and you're just going, I can't do this anymore. You know, similar to the son that left, I moved out of my, my parents' house two days after high school because I just had the opportunity, and so I did it. And I thought, I'm on my own. I can do things on my own. You know what? My mom never let me buy sugary cereal, so I went to the store and bought four boxes of Captain Crunch. And I had the biggest tummy ache the next morning because I thought I could do things on my own. But doing life on our own, we, we get crushed. You ever been physically crushed? All right, I got, I got a story for you guys. So... 
I bought a gym membership about a month ago, trying to, trying to get back in and, you know, honor God and all things I do. And, and so in high school, my freshman year, actually my freshman year of college was the most in shape I've ever been. I was doing really well in the weight room. So I thought last month, let me just go back in the weight room and lift what I used to lift at the most in shape I've ever been in my life. So I went over to, to the bench press, uh, the, the bench, put some weight on there and thought, I got this. I can do this on my own. It's cool. Take a deep breath and I push off and instantly the, all the weight just comes crashing down on my chest. And all I can think about is who is looking at me right now. <laughs> and so what I do is I'm in this very vulnerable position being crushed by way too much weight. I lean to my left and I slide off these plates. And the moment those plates slide off, the whole bar flings over and makes this super loud noise. And I fall over on the other side of the bench. And everybody looks at me, you know what I did? I started doing push-ups. It's like, yeah, I'm supposed to be down here. That was on purpose. I meant to do that. I'm pretty sure some people saw me. It was humiliating. I no longer go to the gym at, on that day or that time in fear of seeing those same people. I go to like an old person's gym too, so it's like they were all laughing at me. Sorry, a more mature person's gym. You know, I could go about my life like that too. Where I just, I, I, I like to pile as many things as I can and in my pride I go, man, I can handle this. I can do this by myself. I don't need a spotter, I don't need accountability. I, I can do this on my own. And I look at all the weight and I lift it up and I end up getting crushed by the very things I put on myself because I, I don't have that kind of strength. And I notice that when I feel crushed, I lose joy. I, I've expressed that to you guys and even my wife has called it out, like you're losing joy. And, it's because I, I, I don't have the strength to do this stuff on my own. I, I push people closest to me away. I, I find it very hard to humbly come before God and tell him that I can't handle what I'm dealing with in my life. I don't like admitting I can't do something on my own. I feel like a loser. I don't like admitting that on my own I'm an inconsiderate husband. On my own I'm, I'm selfish and not very loving. And on my own, I get really overwhelmed by the tiniest struggles, and they pile on, and I start to feel crushed by my life. You know, I was at teen camp, and there's this beautiful, it's not teen camp, it's teen retreat, by the way, this is like a resort. And so I'm at the lake with the palm trees uh, right outside my room, and I'm sitting on the lake, and for the first time in a long time, I felt like my life finally just slowed down. I started praying, and I, and I kind of, you ever crack yourself up in your head and you laugh and you laugh out loud and people think you're weird? So I started laughing and this, this camper just looked at me like, oh, dang, that's the dude's leading this camp. That gets weird. <laughs> but I was thinking in my head, I was going, I can't do this. And not in like a weird, like, I'm leaving the church. You're like, oh, who's preaching to us right now? Not in that way, but I can't do this. I need God. I can't do this on my own. I, I can't be a great husband. I can't be a great friend. I can't pursue the dreams I feel like God has called me to pursue. I, I can't help people. I can't do this life on my own. I need God's strength. In Isaiah 40, verse 31, it says, But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not faint. Oh, I love that. That being poor in spirit is where you find a renewed strength. Or I love what Paul has figured out in 2 Corinthians Verse 12, I don't have it written there on the screen, but I'm gonna read it to you guys. And again, in the NLT version, Paul says, three different times, I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. 
That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults and hardships and persecutions, the troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, a lot of times we fall into the illusion that being strong is doing life on your own. Handling business and not admitting when life is just too much. But in my experience, I've literally witnessed and been a part of people that have just been crushed because there's a lack of humility to go, I need help. I need God. I need to rely on his strength because I clearly am not strong enough. I love how Paul says, my weaknesses is where God fills in the gaps and makes me strong. You know, someone a couple weeks ago said, hey, Sam, why do you make fun of yourself so much on stage? And I was like, you just want me to brag on stage? No, I'm not up here because I got it all together. I'm not up here because I'm a perfect Christian. I'm up here because I have so many weaknesses, but I believe that God, despite my weaknesses, fills in those gaps, and I need God to do that. Being poor in spirit is realizing that you can't do life on your own. If you're visiting with us today, we don't want you to just come to church on Sunday. We believe that that church actually happens more, wait for it, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday through Saturday. Because it's the community of realizing I can't do this on my own. I need God and I need godly people in my life to help me. And that's what being poor in spirit is. You need to be dependent on the almighty power and strength of God. Lastly, I wanna close with this point. We've got to, being poor in spirit is about desiring God's wealth, not your own. Those who are poor in spirit desire God's wealth, not their own. You know, the son in this story, he didn't want to take or partake in anything that the father had, right? He wanted wealth for himself, which led him to squandering everything he had and left him time and time again feeling unfulfilled. You know, to me, this is the perfect illustration about how when we selfishly value wealth, the wealth we can attain on this earth we're just left unfulfilled. And I don't just mean money, but I mean anything that, that, that we can receive from this world, we go after, and time and time again, we're left feeling unfulfilled. In Philippians 4, verse 19, it reads, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. So again, I'm not a parent, but I've learned something about dads. Okay, it, it, it's in their nature, right? It's, it, you know, fathers who are around and who, are, who are, want to be there for their kids. It's in their nature to want to give to their kids. For, for them to want to partake in what the father has established in his life. And I think that's a, that's a characteristic, that is a, the nature of God. That God wants to give to his kids. He wants to provide. He wants for them to partake in his kingdom, in all the things he already has. You know, something that I think, it, think makes it very difficult for God to do that is when we value and prioritize all these other things that are outside of God's kingdom. That God can't give us what he has. He can't allow us to partake in what he has if we're not prioritizing and seeking it. And then the question becomes, well, how do we know when we're desiring our own wealth over God's? Well, according to the scripture, God's glorious riches, his wealth, is summed up, summed up in Jesus. So a sign that we desire the wealth of the world over God's wealth is if we prioritize anything over studying, following, and desiring to be more and more like Christ. You know, growing up, when I would hear this stuff, people say, we, gotta, we just got to be all about Jesus. I would kind of think, look at those people like, oh, you guys are a bunch of Jesus freaks. This is weird. But essentially, yes. I mean, try to find something in this world that's more fulfilling, more purposeful, more full of hope, more full of peace, more full of grace than, than Jesus. Because when we, we, we seek all these other things, that whether it's our jobs, whether it's money, getting ahead in life, having the perfect kid, and that usually doesn't end up so well, and, and doing all these other things, and we miss the riches, the glorious riches that are found in Jesus. 
You know, I think it's important to, to, to identify what you struggle valuing over Jesus. Because the reality is, is the wealth of, the, wealth of this world is enticing. It's enticing to be rich, to have a lot of nice things, to have great social standing. But in the grand scheme of things, those are the things that lead us to a place that the son found himself in. Lonely and unfulfilled. You know, being poor in spirit is we realize that what God offers through Jesus is the most valuable thing that anyone could ever have. You know, I want to close out by finishing that parable that Jesus told in Luke 15, starting in verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and I'm here starving to death. I will go back and, and get my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer to be worthy to call your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to his father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. You know, the son finally realized his need for the father. He began to trust his father's wisdom over his. Wanted to depend on his father's strength and wanted to be a mere servant in the presence of his father's riches. This young man became so poor in spirit that it led him to his father and his father celebrated when he approached him. The father blessed his son with more than he, he could ask or, or imagine or, or even what he really deserved this son began to live a blessed life because he chose to be poor in spirit. I wanna leave you with this question today, church. Do you see your need for God? You're like, well, I'm at church. No, 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 do you see your need for God? Because if you don't see your need for God, this is just a weird social club that we're all a part of. If you don't see your need for God, this is just something to do on Sunday mornings. If you don't see your need for God, this is just a regular title that 75% of our country has. Being poor in spirit is, is the first step in living a life that is made happy by God. Being poor in, in spirit is trusting his wisdom, following his will over yours. Being poor in spirit is depending on his strength and not yours. And being poor in spirit is desiring God's wealth that is in Jesus over anything you can get for yourself in this world. Living a blessed life by God isn't determined by what you can do for him. Instead, it's established by acknowledging your desperate need for God. So as we continue this series for the weeks to come, I want us to focus and really ask ourselves this question, do I see my need for God? Do I, do I value my relationship with God? Do I, do I fight for my relationship with God? Because being poor in spirit is realizing that it's not being throwing pity parties or just feeling bad about yourself all the time, but it's realizing that Besides the world, world's needs and the physical needs I have, I have some desperate spiritual needs that only God can fulfill. So in the weeks to come, as a church, let's let the culture be men and women who are poor in spirit and desire, need, helplessly are desperate for the relationship with God. Amen. this morning, just about being poor in spirit, helped me to think back on my life, and uh, I hope it did for you as well. Uh, you know, on our trip, it was funny, we were, we were talking about a lot of different things, and one of the things that came up was that 
uh, during some of our talks is that I used to go, I used to attend these meetings when I was a teenager uh, for, uh, for children that had experienced alcoholism uh, in their family. And uh, not only did I experience it with uh, some of my family members, but I experienced it myself for me. And step one in AA or NA or whatever addiction group you're a part of, does anybody know what it is? Yeah, we, admitting that we are powerless over the substance that plagues you. Alcohol, drugs, whatever it is. For us, it may not be alcohol or drugs in here, but it's definitely sin. Sin is addictive and it's destructive. Step one that Jesus is talking about here is admitting that we are powerless over sin without him. And then it goes on to say that our lives had become unmanageable. You know that people don't walk away from sin or their addiction until they see how serious of a problem that it is. How destructive it's become in their life. And Jesus says, I want you to come to me spiritually bankrupt. When you've hit rock bottom, when you are completely devoid of self and any prideful, self-focused spirit that you may have in you, I want you to come to me poor in spirit, admitting that you're powerless and surrendering every area of your life to me. That is how you start the journey to being a citizen of God's kingdom. And I want to ask you this, what would it look like for you to completely come to God powerless, surrendered in every single area of your life? Have you hit rock bottom yet to where you see your need for God? Or are you still coming to him trying to prove your worth? And, and I'm worthy and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm religious and I'm righteous. And I'm holy. No, no, you're not. We need to come to God spiritually bankrupt because we're just a bunch of addicts addicted to sin. I am, you are, every single one of us is. And, and I'm not trying to, you know, talk down to us, to anybody here. But I want us to see our need for God. I want you to decide to pray about this today. Talk with someone about it today. Decide to be poor in spirit. Talk with someone about the sins that plague your life and how you're powerless over them if you don't give them up to God. Give them up to Him fully. Come to God spiritually bankrupt so He can fill you with His Spirit. Thank you so much, Sam, for the message this morning. Great, great job. Yeah, that, was, that was very, very convicting for me. Uh, I do have a couple of announcements before we go into our monthly hope offering. We have our father-son camp coming up, and that is July 26th. I know this is a highlight for so many dads uh, that like to take their children. You could take your kids as you know, young as one or two years old if you feel like they could handle it. Uh, take them up there. It's going to be a great, great time. I believe it's going to be near a lake. In, is it Temecula or Marietta? Silverwood. Okay, so make sure that you register at the website, at the church website. There's, uh, there's some spots still left. Get there, you know, get registered as soon as possible for July 26th. Also, we are getting ready to start uh, grief recovery classes. They're going to be held in Rancho Cucamonga, and they're going to be Monday nights from 7 to 9 p.m. They go for eight weeks. And it's $300 per person, and that comes with materials, everything included, to be able to be part of that class. If there's something in your life that you feel that you're grieving over, you know, things that have hurt you, things that have really messed up your life, these are, these are classes that you could go to and really work at a pace that is going to be, you know, something that works for you, to be able to help you work through those things that have plagued you and hurt you, uh, in your life, whether it's the death of a loved one uh, or something in your life that you have really struggled with and you feel stuck, 
uh, buy. Uh, these are things that, these are classes that could really help you. Again, $300 per person for the eight weeks. It's $160 for campus students. Uh, these are some classes that have really changed a lot of people's lives and have allowed God to speak to them through these to be able to help them. If you're interested in going to these grief recovery classes, speak with Ashley Baines, and her phone number is found on our website as well. Turn over with me to Matthew 25. At this time, we're going to go ahead and go into our Hope Collection talk. Each month, we take up a collection to help uh, those that are less fortunate. Uh, this collection goes to Hope Worldwide, which is the, the benevolent arm of our church. Right now, I know that even this past week, um, a group from the Riverside Church went over to a veteran center uh, that was uh, contacted by, uh, by Rod and uh, Rod Lloyd. And I, and I want to thank you guys so much, uh, the Lloyd family, for being able to be part of this and heading this up. But they have a lot of needs uh, that need to be met. There's some painting that needs to take place, some weeding, a lot of different efforts to be able to get some veterans that are going to be living uh, in this facility to get it up and ready. And we're going to send different family groups from the Riverside Ministry here uh, to go paint, to go weed, to do some landscaping. And it takes money to do some of these types of things. And as we do these things, we basically are bringing Jesus to people that perhaps would not have any other way uh, to, receive it, to receive him. And we're going out there and presenting the gospel to them and our love for them and our, our ability to serve them. In Matthew 25, starting in verse 34, it says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world, for I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick? or in prison, and go to visit you. The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. The scripture here is really encouraging for disciples of Jesus that really understand that the nature of God is to serve those who are needy, to love those that may be hard to love, to go after helping meet the needs of those around us. And again, not just to help them to not suffer in life, because there's suffering all around us, as Rick was talking about. There's so many causes out there to be able to help people with. But to be able to bring them the gospel where they're at. To be able to say to them, look, I love you, and Jesus loves you too. And with our giving, we promote you know, the helping of many people around us that are in need. With giving to hope this morning, you could open up the way for the gospel to be preached to people in need. Maybe they're not able to see past their need. When we meet those needs, hopefully they're able to see Jesus through us. Let's pray as we give. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much for the message that we heard this morning. Thank you, Father, that somebody could come up here and teach us about how to live the kingdom life. God, help us to embrace each and every aspect of it as we learn through the next probably two months about what the kingdom life is all about. I pray that the giving this morning be generous. I pray, God, that you help to multiply the offering that we give. God, I pray that we give to be able to advance the gospel in every need that presents itself through hope worldwide, through our interaction with those that maybe are not able to see past their needs. I pray that our love and our servitude goes a long way in opening up the doors of their heart, that they may see your love for them. 
God, I pray that we're able to impact people not just for a brief moment in time, but for eternity through the gospel. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if the trees are finished passing, why don't we all stand up, sing one more song uh, to close us down. How are we feeling today? Yeah. yeah? That was a great service, right? Let's give a round of applause for, uh, for, this, for the service. Hey. <laughs> all right, we're going to sing Whose Side Are You Fighting On? Who's side are you 